Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, be back. I, was, uh, I have been at every one of those uh, GYSS. So I'm an old time. I'm also uh, a faculty member at NTU. So it feels like coming home this morning. <laughs> so uh, yeah, the uh, lecture will be on uh, mainly on molecular photovoltaics. And, uh, some of my lecture will be uh, dedicated to the, the son of the molecular photovoltaic cells, or Dyson stress cells, is the, photo, the perovskite cells. So, so we, will t we will move towards this uh, topic where at the end of my lecture, and then in the outbreak session, we will deal with the perovskite solar cells in more detail. So, yeah, so here's... Uh, just a picture of a, uh, uh, this is a, a green panel that uses this particular uh, porphyrin dye as, uh, to sensitize the photocount in the uh, uh, TiO2 uh, support. Uh, so so this, this is the molecular machine, if you like, or, or electrical machine that drives the cell. And, uh, and we can scale it up. You see here some panels that that are used to charge as cause charging stations. And so this cell has, uh, has gone a long way from uh, conception like 30 years ago. And then it was a long phase of basic research and uh, fact finding and finally some industrial development which, so I'll take you through that journey. And first of all, the inspiration how we uh, conceived this uh, concept of molecular sensitization. And then this is an embodiment of the cell. You see these beads? The, these are mesoporous TI2 beads. And uh, the, uh, the dye is absorbed as a self assembled monolayer within the pores of these beads. And so when light hits the beads, electric current is generated. And, uh, a surge of, of uh, current comes out of these beads. You can get close to 100% conversion of incoming photons to electric current with these, with these architectures. And so then, uh, so this uh, is a laboratory cell. We have two, two glasses, the conducting collector. And so that has made it to large scale application. I show here the Swiss Tech Convention Center. That's uh, one of the first scale-ups of our device. But there has also been evolution from dyes. Uh, we moved to pigments as light absorbers. And, and one of the pigments that has been very successful is the, uh, the perovskite pigment. And, and so this has taken off uh, uh, enormously with today efficiencies, uh, uh, 23, close to 24% from 3% 10 years ago. And uh, you see a, a small laboratory cell. The Perska is still at the laboratory scale, but some scale up is happening. And you can also see that these cells will electroluminesce. So they can uh, both convert light to ele electricity and electricity to light, very much in keeping with what Einstein had predicted. So let's start that. So here's uh, my outline on motivation, inspiration, research approach. And then we'll go into the details and later some application commercial deployment. So the uh, motivation, uh, yeah, uh, it's just to respond to the urgent need for renewable energy resources. Nobody will contest that the consumption goes up in the next 50 years, we go from 18 to 50 terawatts. And the share of uh, renewable has to go up from 20 currently to 80%. So that means the photovoltaics has to really bear, bear the, the burden. It, it, it will have to be scaled up 200 times from currently 50 uh, gigawatts to 10 terawatts. And uh, so that's a challenge. And uh, the challenge is to keep the, uh, the rise of temperature within the within the Paris Agreement, two degrees. And that's the Shell Corporation's sky scenario, which have, has been used to, to, to 
uh, draw up those, uh, those, uh, those maps. And, uh, and so the challenge is to scale up photovoltaics by a factor of 200. And so photosynthesis is already uh, uh, converting 95 terawatts. So that's five times our present consumption. But that's stored energy, so it's actually more valuable than, uh, than electrical energy. It's stored in chemical bonds and mainly sugar. So our inspiration comes from this photosynthetic system that uses a, a molecule, not a semiconductor, as a light absorber. It's not a PN junction, it's a molecular absorber. And, and so how does charge separation happen in the green leaf? Well, it happens by kinetics. You have light-driven electron transfer reactions, and there's always the back reaction problem. You store light, electron transfer reaction. So you have to kind of assemble your system, your photosystem, so that the back reactions are slower than the forward-carrying uh, uh, reactions. So uh, yeah, so, in, uh, so here we have the PN, uh, classical PN junction, where this back reaction is prevented by the electrical field in the junction. And in, in the Dyson stress cells, we use a uh, wide band gap oxide semiconductor, for example, TiO2, which is an electron selective contact. So in other words, the dye gets excited, you move the electron to an excited level, and only the electron will go in the oxide. The positive charge cannot. There is no level available that would capture positive charge. So, so we have that electron selective contact, and we need to have a, if you like, a positive charge selective contact on the other side. That's all you need for a photovoltaic device. And so we need to carry the positive charge on the die, from the die to the counter electrode. So how does that happen? Well, let's put the molecular machine in, uh, in motion. So you have uh, the, uh, the dye is uh, excited, then you inject, collect the carriers, you do the work, and then you have to bring the electron back to the dye, otherwise you would consume the dye. And so this cycle has to run many, many times in, uh, in 25 years, outdoor service, you, you do 100 million turnovers. That's a lot for, for a catalytic reaction, 100 million turnovers. But it's possible by, by uh, designing the, the, the molecular dye structure in a judicious way, you can get those high turnover numbers. And so let's put the machine in motion, injection, uh, collection, and the work is done, and we bring in the electron back, and, and so the shuttle is very important. This is a, it could be a solid state or electrolyte shuttle. For a long time, iodine iodide was used, but uh, there is a mismatch. As you can see, this is drawn for iodine iodide. If you use a shuttle like that, you lose a lot of energy in the regeneration step of the dye. And, but that has been now solved the problem by using copper complexes and get better efficiencies that way. So starting with the sensitization picture, that that's, uh, goes back to, uh, I mean, the late 60s, people were interested in color photography. And uh, there you have the silver halide sensitization, very similar to what happens in our system. The dye injects, and an uh, electron is, uh, is uh, formed in a conduction band. And, uh, and uh, but that process, if you do it on a flat surface, is extremely uh, inefficient. And you can see the paper I just cite here. Actually, Professor Bailey is still uh, active. She's here in Singapore at the CREATE Center. <laughs> so she's not here in the audience. <laughs> she's a good friend. So anyway, here you see the reporting car in 0.2 micrograms. Well, normally a, a photovoltaic cell should draw 20 milliamps. So you can see we, we, we're missing several orders of magnitude. So these are very, very inefficient cells. And when I was a young person, a, a young postdoc, the people told me not to move in this area. It was, it's a lost, lost effort and doomed. Uh, but uh, we came from a different angle. We had actually, we, we were studying nanocrystals. We were the first to make those nanocrystals, oxide nanocrystals in the 80s. And so we are interested in the fundamental uh, 
reactions or redox reactions. For example, you make electron hole pair in the nanocrystal. You, you watch how fast it recombines. And so, uh, so we were first to do this kind of studies. And uh, so we also did sensitization studies of these, uh, for example, strontium titanate nanocrystals. Here's our sensitizer. It has the carboxylate attaching groups. They bind coordinatively the molecule to the oxide surface. And uh, yeah, so when you, uh, in solution, when you add the, the these systems were dispersed as, uh, as nanocrystals, but you don't see them. They're so small that it looks like water, if you like. And uh, you can use a laser beam to excite the system and then study the reactions by flash photolysis. And that's what we did, and we found that injection, that was a seminal paper we published many years ago in 1985, more than 30 years ago. But for the first time, we found there that uh, we have, you see that synthesis is important. We have achieved strikingly high efficiency in sensitization of colloidal anatase particles. Today, they are called nanoparticles. And polycrystalline electrodes using this particular sensitizer. And so that was a, a fundamental research, curiosity-driven, just pure curiosity-driven. But, but then when we found out that the injection step was much faster, orders of magnitude, nine orders of magnitude faster than the re recombination of the electron with the oxidized dye species, we uh, started to think about the photovoltaic application. And so, yeah, so we built uh, an array. We, we just uh, deposited an array of these particles by screen printing on a conductive support. This is glass with a conducting layer on top. And then we dipped the film in a dye solution. The, a self-assembled monolayer was formed by spontaneous interaction of the carboxylate groups with the titanium ions. And so that was our working electrode. And uh, it just show, I show you a picture of the, uh, of the uh, TI2 nanocrystals with their surface facets. Very nice, very nice stuff. So what did we find? We found, surprisingly, that huge photocons are generated. Typically, 10,000 times higher. 10,000 times, not a factor of two, 10,000 times higher. To the extent that first people didn't believe that the experiment was carried out correctly, okay? So, uh, so I, I used to travel with my electrodes and give presentations and to convince our country that it was, it was correct, okay? It was real, and, and so, uh, so we have the, the dye on the nanoparticles, injects electrons, and electrons are then collected through that layer. Now, there is one issue here that, uh, that immediately comes to mind. Uh, the, the nanoparticles are insulating, and so, uh, so how, do you, how come you can uh, collect a, a current through an insulator? And so that was the first thing, okay? And so we found that actually what happens here is that injected electrons, um, turns one electron injected one of those nanoparticles, turns the nanoparticle in a conductor from an insulator to a conductor because so small uh, that on a nanoscale that you, so there is a positive feedback here. The more light you have on the system, the more electrons you inject, the lower is the resistance of your film. And, and that saves you, that makes that film a very interesting uh, 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 collector, charge collector. And so, just to summarize, what's the virtues of those structures? We, we have this huge internal surface area that uh, helps with light harvesting. We can extract the electron selectively from the excited dye, and the electron is just facilitated through screening. Why can we move charges through these films? They need to be screened, otherwise you would have a Coulomb blockade effect. And so uh, the, the ions on the surface do that for you. So we have all the ingredients, and, and so you see the effects now. If we uh, look at the, just a single crystal, very, very small yields, 0.1% of the incoming photons at best, at the maximum, are converted to uh, electric current. But here with the nanocrystals, the uh, over 80% much broader response. This costs you a few, few, a few cents. Uh, this, this costs us $60,000 to make those single crystals. Why? Well, 
we didn't have them, so we had to employ a technician to work for six months to make those single crystals. And so uh, now, so let's just see the molecular interactions. This, this is a typical dye structure, ruthenium complex with the cyanide. And initially, ruthenium complexes were largely used because they are very stable. And so, uh, so carboxylate interact with the dye uh, with the oxide surface coordinatively uh, by, by uh, uh, bidentate uh, coordination. Uh, you can see the effect here. This uh, dip the film, it turns dark. The dye goes on spontaneously. And it forms a monolayer. Once you have saturated the surface size, both it stops. And uh, just think about it. This layer, this solution layer is about one centimeter. The dye is it's only 10 micron thick, but it has a deeper color. So you really have now uh, concentrated the absorber in these pores of the nanocrystal film and I get a very good light absorption, light harvesting. And as I said, you can, uh, you can image the dye molecules. This is on a single crystal. It's, uh, scanning tunnel microscopy. You see these dye molecules, the pyridyl ligands. They don't look like a nicely organized self-assembled monolayer. I think some people have actually uh, illusions <laughs> about how the monolayer looks. And, and today we know that if we use combinations of dyes or coadsorbents, we can get a much better organization on the surface. And so this, uh, if, you, if you do the massaging with the computer, you can figure out how the dye goes on the surface. And that's uh, very helpful. So you know now that mostly the coordination goes through this bidentate bridging uh, ligand. And so here's the uh, injection process. You have some DFT calculations. So see this bidentate bridging, this titanium, this carboxylate. And so excitation, you, you move electrons from the homo to the lumo, and then injection happens. And here's that we, we image that on a time scale of picoseconds using laser flash spectroscopy. You see the reactions over in one picosecond. So that's the charge separation over in one picosecond. And then what happens? Nothing. The charge remains separated. I told you that it takes a very long time for the charge to recombine. And so that's the fundamental effect that we are ex ex exploiting in the solar cells. Injection much more rapid than recombination. And so, as I mentioned to you, the, the, the electrons can make it through these particles uh, because of screening, and, and so we can move a charge in and out through the insulating particles without any troubles, and we can, image, we can model that. This is a so-called uh, transmission line modeling. And this, I uh, could do impedance spectroscopy and find out what it Recombination resistance is how fast do the electrons recombine and how fast do they move through the film. So these two parameters decide how much, uh, how much your collection efficiency is. So the transport and recombination resistance, they can be evaluated from field spectroscopy. And so you can, uh, you can find out your collection efficiency. And all you need is solve the, the continuity equation, and that's a a well-known equation in semiconductor physics. You have the generation term of, of, of carriers and then diffusion term and recombination term. So, and uh, all of this is uh, stationary illumination. This is zero, the number of carriers per time change of concentration, zero. And so this, this has become a, a common tool to evaluate how good your cells are and whether you collect the carriers, and uh, actually I should mention there's no drift term in this equation because you're screening. There's no field in these particles. It's all just kinetics. How fast do the electrons move through this by diffusion and not by drift? And so uh, this is the final picture. So injection very fast, this regeneration term, microseconds. And then this critical, how fast is the transport, how fast is the recombination? So here I have 100 times faster transport compared to recombination, I plug this in, okay, and I get collection efficiency. This ratio is the same as the ratio I showed before in the resistances. 
the ratio of resistance is, 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 is the same as, the, as these time constants. So, so we build a cell and it uh, uh, worked well. So that, that, uh, that was published in Nature in 91. It was a, a highly cited paper. Uh, I don't want to brag with our citations, but uh, this one became one of the top 100 papers ever published in science. Uh, uh, why was that? Well, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's just, uh, the first time people had, had built a, a photovoltaic cell with a three-dimensional uh, junction. So these are nanocrystalline junctions. Nobody had done that before. Where actually the prevailing opinion was that you should have a flat PN junction and there was a field in the, in the, uh, in the junctions to collect, to separate carriers. But that is totally different, a different approach. It's more close to the natural system. And so, yeah, so we got over 20,000 citations so far in this paper. And uh, so, yeah, so then we also had protected the invention and the number of patents has been growing rapidly. And here's our first cell we, we built in 88, a very rocket, uh, remember I showed it in Chicago at a conference and, and people didn't quite believe that <laughs> this was anything important to do an experiment, the beaker with the photoelectrode here, the platinum gauze counter electrode and the electrolyte. But this was the very essence of the invention. And uh, we could uh, then improve and go to, to sandwich structures and then scale up happened. And some products on the market now, like these panels, glass panels and flexible. And so here are some more, more Evolution. I bought myself some of, some of these green panels to charge my, my hybrid electric car, so it's useful. And uh, so it's this convention center, uh, very nice, aesthetically uh, convincing. And this produces the electric power that is used to, uh, for the uh, for uh, the consumption, covered consumption of the center. And so also in China, some for bigger projects now. And there was an article, I don't know what this means here in Chinese, but <laughs> I hope it's not <laughs> derogatory, okay. So, uh, so yeah, now let's just talk uh, briefly about the molecular engineering of the sensitizers. And this is a key, this is the, this is the motor of the, uh, of the device. I mean, uh, the nanostructure is very essential to capture the light and to, to collect the carriers. But the key is a molecular uh, component. Like chlorophyll is the key component of the green leaf, okay? So, uh, so yeah, initially, as I mentioned to you, we had used those carothenium complexes. And, and we had used ionic liquids as electrolytes because they're very stable. They, 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 you can't kill them. They have no, practically no vapor pressure. And, and so we use these iodide salts. They have iodine and iodide, a redox couple in it. And you see, for example, this is a full light, 4,000 hours. So the, on the panel, in full sunlight at 60 degrees for half a year. And with the ionic click, nothing changed. So they're very, very rocket systems. We even tested them I'm in, in Saudi Arabia in the desert and uh, make sure <laughs> that they would even survive long time under these conditions. And so evolution went to different ruthenium dyes. Uh, we're getting more and more photons collected. You see this particular complex goes up to 1,000 nanometers. This, all the visible and near IR is covered. And so these systems, uh, the, the latest one that is, uh, was from Professor Segawa in Tokyo, University of Tokyo. He, this complex is, uh, generating 32 milliamps per square centimeter photocon. That's like a silicon photovoltaic cell. Now, what's the difference? You need much less sensitizer. Uh, I would say a thousand times less in weight than what the silicon cell needs. Because these are direct band, band gap materials and you have only a monolayer on the surface. Same holds for the perovskite solar cells. Much less material, much cheaper. No high temperature vacuum steps. So this was a very successful development. But 
more to come because then uh, people say, well, there's not enough ruthenium. Uh, show us something different, doesn't have a Nobel Medal. And so we did. So, so the, uh, uh, this took off uh, Anders Hartfeld, a number of groups, uh, our cells. So first, we, we, these donor acceptor dyes were made. So they are designed, the donor moiety is away from the surface, acceptor is attached to the surface. So electrons flow from top to bottom on excitation, you see. And that's what you want. You want positive charge to be away from the surface because it will recapture the electrons, a recombination <coughs> issue. And so, but then the more sophisticated, of course, it's uh, with the chromophore, where you have a chromophore in the middle. And uh, so these, these systems are very successfully worked on presently. And uh, we have, for example, a 14.3% Die. That's from a Japanese group. You see the donor. This is the bridge with the thiophenes. And this is the binding group, this uh, thiolene or the cyanoacrylate, acceptor binding group. And you can also do, be using, of, uh, of course, computational uh, tools to, to design the best die species. And, and the, the, the computer's getting better and better, the program's getting better and better, so that you can, with a good uh, code, you can actually, within point 0.1 uh, EV, you can predict what the absorption of a dye is, so you don't have to make all these dyes. You can, the computer will tell you whether on the right track or not. And here's for a, a, a success, uh, this green dye, it looks almost like the chlorophyll has a porphyrin core and donor, acceptor, and uh, we published in science uh, a few years ago, and so this makes this beautiful green color, and uh, we did also some calculations, quantum mechanics, molecular mechanic calculations, and you can see the orbital structure here. We have the, the ground state is the blue uh, orbital distribution, uh, so this electron density map, and then you excite it, you you move the electrons towards the left here. That's where the attaching group is. So that's what you want. You want an electron to go towards the surface when you excite the dye. And then the positive charge is stuck on the donor, so it's far away, so that the recombination reaction is, is much slower because it has to go through a tunneling process over a long distance, and these processes are very, very slow. And so here are some applications for these beautiful green dyes. And uh, like we have this uh, noise ball. I mentioned to you in the beginning this uh, charging station. This is a bridge in Lausanne, this private home in Switzerland. Uh, I bought some panels for my sister. She also uses it on the balcony. And so, uh, yeah, so these things have now become a commercial reality. And, uh, and also, we have been learning how to get better monolayers by, for example, using combinations of sensitizers and change the iodine we, we're using now, copper complexes. They are much better adjusted to the, see here's your dye level, the dye levels, HOMO, LUMO. So in the regeneration step, you want to have, uh, you want to be as close as possible to the, uh, to the dye level. And, and so that the losses are minimal in the cell. And that's achieved with those copper complexes. So that under ambient light, we get 32% efficiency. That's ambient light, like diffused daylight, better than gallium arsenide. And you see here's a so-called JV curve. This is current potential curve, high voltage. You see the spectral response from 700 on. We collect all the photons and convert with over Close to 90%, and the photons are converted in electric current that you measure outside of the cell. So you can do much better with the gallium arsenide. Actually, we feel slightly better than a gallium arsenide with these devices in diffuse light. And so some products have now been using this very high efficiency in ambient condition. And uh, so you see this, uh, for example, uh, and my sister goes hiking. She always has this backpack charging her phone all the time with these flexible cells. And uh, so here are all the advantages. I gave one to Bill Gates when he, he asked me to visit him a few years ago. Uh, he, he really liked it a lot. 
And he actually was kind to us in a statement he made in November 2015 at the Paris conference, light sensitive dye. This is what he now, for the first time, he understood. He was very curious. How does that cell function? And we spent four hours with him to explain to him all the details, including the notion of quasi-Fermi level. He asked me that question. So, uh, so recently he has set up a $1 billion fund to, uh, to support uh, uh, work in solar fuels. He, he, this is a picture that was taken at uh, Caltech some few years ago. And this is Nate Lewis. He's a professor in Caltech invited him. And so we also gave a pair back to Al Gore. This is a banker. He used my bag. That was the last one I had. So, <laughs> so uh, recently, we have made some new ones. And so, so some other commercial, because in, especially in Asia and Japan, we have all these. This is an indoor product. It collects uh, uh, indoor light and so that you have battery-free displays. And you see the dye cell is, is seen here. And uh, this uh, e-reader with internal, eternal life means eternal battery life because the, the solar cells on the, t on, the t on the top of the uh, cell and charges all the time the battery by, by diffuse light. And so this company is also successful, uh, is, uh, uh, has been hiring, so if you're interested, we also have a, a, a panel producer next door. This a company called H Class, and they hired all my my postdocs. So I'm now <laughs> I have to uh, to search by the good people again, <laughs> which is a pain, you know. It's a, I was kind of mad when this happened, and so so uh, so this is another Japanese company. Uh, and uh, oh yeah, I meant to tell you when this. Remember this nuclear accident that happened. The a company I see in Seiki is part of the Toyota consortium. They made those lights. So you see, this is a dye-sensitized cell. I got one of those actually. Uh, somebody took it away from me. I, I'm still <laughs> looking for the person who snatched it. But I got one from the company and. Uh, it just collects diffuse light and charge batteries. So in the evening, the folks could have some light in their shelters, OK? It was a, a terrible the situation in Japan. And so uh, look at the happy face of this couple. They have their own light source. You know, it's, when it comes to the elementals, you, you, uh, you have to, uh, you, you're happy with very, very few uh, co commodities. So, yeah, few remarks on first kite solar cells. As I said to you, we have a breakout session later today, and I will get more into details. These are complex systems, and we need more time than just a few minutes. So, so the first kite they evolved from Dyson solar cells. And as I said, they're much more complex than silicon. They have, these are ionic crystals. So they have ionic conduction, electronic conduction, and they have a great variety of compositions, like the halides, the axis here the, at the corners of the octahedra. These are halide, and you have the uh, metal ion in the center. Germanium is another option for metal ion. And then you have all these cations that charge compensating. They have to fit in the pocket. So, uh, so only a few will fit. Cesium, formamidinium, methyl ammonium, guanidinium. And then the, the complexity increases with the two-dimensional cross guides. So if you use a cation that has a long chain, then you make these structures called uh, rudelson popper structures or Diane-Jacobson structures. So you can see this is a, a mind-boggling. I show you a three-dimensional chess game here. So that's like you're playing a three-dimensional chess game. And <laughs> that's a challenging thing to do. So, so the challenge is to, to, uh, to grasp all of this. And, uh, and uh, we are working, there are many groups working on it. And uh, let me just, uh, this orbital structure. Yeah, I, I, I wrote a review that, sh that kind of, you see 2014, that kind of makes a nice summary of the initial phase. How does this whole, whole thing evolve? I will, I will come back to this this afternoon. 
And here's the, the, the evolution. So from 3.8, we have now 23.7%. That was in a few, few years, the efficiency went up uh, stunningly high. And a number of papers, well, when we published our first, in 2012, three papers appeared, three. And uh, last year, uh, something like 2,500. <laughs> And uh, so the total number of papers now 9,000. If you want to read those all, I wish you good luck. <laughs> so, so let me go back and uh, show you why it's so interesting there. You know, the postcards have an interesting orbital structure. Uh, the, uh, the valence band maximum is, uh, is formed by antibonding orbitals. So you take the lead iodide bond, and it's actually antibonding orbitals that form the valence band maximum. That's unusual, usually the valence band maximum silicon is a bonding, on bonding orbitals. So if you cleave that iodide bond, actually the defect you generate has a lower energy. It drops in the valence band. It does not generate a gap state. And so that, that's, that's the key of the path guide. They have very few defect states. That's why they, they can be used as LEDs, and they have high voltages in photovoltaics. And so this has the fact that you can solution process them, and uh, you have this very low defect density because of the special orbital structure. This has um, made the difference with regards to other semiconductors like cadmium telluride or copper idium selenide. And so, uh, yeah, so, so this, uh, yeah, so today's formulations are usually mixed cations. It's just for reasons of optical absorption and stability. And so for my medium methyl ammonium, we had been the first to point out that if you take the form amidinium alone, it's not stable. It forms a yellow phase at room temperature, so the perovskite phase is not stable. It goes into a yellow phase as useless or photovoltaics, but if you mix it with the methyl ammonium, you get a stable first cut phase. So that was the essence of this paper we published. And, and from there on, everybody uses those mixtures because they, they have better light absorption, higher stability. And, and also when you use cesium, same thing happens. Cesium is, uh, it forms a yellow phase. So cesium lead iodide, useless for, for photovoltaics. For my dimensionality, it's yellow, useless for photovoltaics. But if you mix them, you just have to grind those two materials. It turns black. Bell's guide is formed. So magic. Uh, this is entropy driven. So uh, some papers we published, uh, we were one of the first groups that discovered this. And today we have these high efficiency devices that can serve also as elect electroluminescent cells. And so let me finish. I have six more minutes. That's our chairman. <laughs> OK, so don't worry, I'll be on time. And so, uh, so yeah, I, I should mention to you that, uh, yes, we have good efficiency, but this is only part of the story. I mean, uh, the stability is critical. And in the postcards, we have this ionic conduction. And just think about it. If you have a photovoltaic cell, under light, there's a potential gradient generated. Electrons go to one side and a positive charge to the other side of the device. So front and back, there's a, it's a char charging effect. And so there's a voltage generated. And so if you have ions, they, they have a tendency to move, uh, to get transported in this electric field. So that, that's a complication. It could be actually a disaster. <laughs> Fortunately, we are not quite sad to say that, but we have to thoroughly explore that. And so, so uh, yeah, so stability and scale up. Cost is very, very low because uh, these, i show you later picture cross-sectional. These things can be, they're, they're almost the same, the dream of a photovoltaic paint. You can paint the post grade. And uh, I wouldn't recommend you to do that without being in a hood because of the lead problem. Okay, don't want to have the lead inhaled. So, but in principle, you can paint it on a, a tin, for example. You can paint it, 
and you will get your photovoltaically active layer. So it's a very simple way to make them. We, so we have, for example, just uh, scaled up, we published paper in science some, a couple of years ago, how to scale up and uh, get high efficiencies. And here we're we tackling now these, uh, the, uh, the stabilities and that's very, very important to get stabilized efficiencies. By the way, here's the cross section of the, the cell. And as you can see, we have, this is the glass. The half of this cross section is for the glass and conducting a layer on top. And then this is our perovskite cell, just 300, 400 nanometer. Here we have a gold counter electrode. And uh, so this whole device is only about uh, less than a micron thick. Uh, silicon cells, 300 micron thick. So you can uh, say right away that there's a much more material needed for silicon. Why is that? Well, it's indirect band gap. So you have less light absorption, you have thicker layers. Here we have a direct band gap, very strong light absorption. You, you only need a few hundred nanometer thick absorber layer. So here you see that again, we have copper thiocyanate as a whole conductor. And and here's gold. Now we, got a, we took the gold away recently and used just carbon as a back contact. Because I know you can't sell a cell that's made out of gold. I mean, that would be really <laughs> expensive. Okay. So, so uh, and here we, we could stabilize by putting some kind. There was some interaction between the copper thiazide and the gold. We stopped it with a graphene layer. And in between, and so this this now thousand hours maximum power point sixty degrees. That's the first test you should do. Subject your cell at maximum power point. That is a condition where it delivers maximum power, and then you wait thousand hours, measure regularly your power, and thousand hours six weeks full light on the cell six weeks nothing happened. Then first relief. If something happens in those 1,000 hours, say you lose 10%, you're already on a, on a bad path. Okay. So, so recently, we, as I said, we, we have carbon. So really, these are the, the stable systems. If today I had to buy a Postcard solar cell, I would use the one we developed <laughs> just because it's stable. Okay. It's not the top efficiency. It's about 20%, or, but it's stable. Okay. So. Uh, yeah, here's some activity at NTU. They also use carbon for scale up, and Professor Suberth Michael, Michael saw, and Nippon Matthews. Tomorrow we will have a, 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 a group session with them, the latest exchange, the latest results. And so this scaled up, these are the Singapore cells. This is the, uh, this is the center in Wuhan that has my name, and so, uh, the uh, Professor Hahn, he developed also a carbon cell. Somehow the perovskite lost carbon, and so the system is very, very stable. And so, uh, yeah, so he built those panels. And last year I was in Wuhan and, uh, in July. I tell you, it was very, very hot there, 32 degrees. I was exhausted with a jet lag, and I thought it would collapse. It was heat in the sun. And, and the panels, 70 degrees. So, so these panels have to support high temperatures and high light levels. That's a, so it's the right thing to do to put them outside and test and see what happens. And so, yeah. So I'm almost through. I have one more minute. This is just some commercial outlook. The final slides I show you is for education. We, have, uh, we meet with young, going back to Dyson Styles. We have young uh, students from the, uh, from the uh, schools visiting, and they build their own cells using uh, either tea, uh, uh, tin or tea, tea, or, or, or these are raspberries or uh, uh, blackberries. Uh, so the dye is actually from the blackberry. It goes on. And this is quantum mechanical modeling, what happens when you excite these dyes, the anthocyanins. And uh, so finally, yeah, so finally, we can even go to younger kids. Look how infatuated they are with, the, with these making their own solar cells. Very important to educate the youngsters to get involved. And so with that, I'm, uh, 
at eight seconds. <laughs> wow, that was really good. Fed. I can just show you the most important slide. We still have snow in Switzerland. Please come to visit us for skiing. Thank you. <laughs>